Yo, it's Q Harrison Terry, and you're now tuned into the NFT QT podcast. I have a very special guest today. It's not an NFT expert, and it's not someone who is deep into the crypto and blockchain space. But if you're familiar with the fine art world, then you definitely know who this is. It's David Sally. For those of you who don't know, David Sally is a world-renowned contemporary artist whose work can be found everywhere from the Guggenheim in New York to the Tate Gallery in London to the Art Institute of Chicago. I actually was over at his studio in New York when he first told me that he was about to mint his first NFT. And I was like, wait, 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 what? You already conquered the art world. Why NFTs and why right now? He said he was working with a team called Dementi to help him bring his Tree of Life paintings into the digital medium and that his first NFT was going to be called a well-leafed tree. Frankly, I was somewhat astounded that an accomplished fine artist was choosing to dive into the NFTs. And I had to get the download from the source. So I asked him if I could pick his brain. What you're about to hear is a behind the scenes look into David Sally's thoughts on NFTs from David's studio in New York. Enjoy. It's a pleasure to be sitting here with you, David Sally. You've done a lot and now you're walking into a pretty technological space in the world of NFTs. What makes you interested by this medium? I've always loved animation. I've always wanted to make animated images. And when I look at my paintings, I, th I think they're animated already. So the idea that I get to now actually see them be come to life, that's what I've been looking for. And you chose the tree of life, ironically enough. Well, exactly. There's a, there's a lot to work with. The tree gives us all kinds of things to work with. Uh, so it's where I'm at in the paintings. So it's where we're starting. It's our starting point for the, for the NFT. But the, um, the ability to make things move in time um, is, uh, is, like, is, is like painting plus a bonus. You know, paintings don't move. They do everything except move. Right. So now we get to make a painting and make it move is, uh, is the ideal. When you were approaching this project and taking the painting saying, I want to make it come to life, I'm sure you learned a lot about NFTs in the process and just what's possible and what's not possible. When I look at your artwork in many ways, it's a collage, right? Like you started with the tree in this painting, but then what was the next object? And then what started the poem? The poem really starts with the people, okay. with the characters. The tree is the is the, let's say, the, um, uh, the, well, the tree is the, is the, is the voice of God, to put, it, to put it in simple terms. The tree is determining what the people are able to do, but they don't know that. I mean, trees literally give us oxygen, right? Well, trees give us everything, and, and what's underneath the ground is what allows the tree to give us what it can but it does, so we need to be very aware of where the tree is, you know, what it's arising out of. Um, I started making these paintings uh, before the pandemic, but I was deep into the series in the, in the lockdown, and it was at that time I realized they were a kind of perfect metaphor for this kind of situation we were in, that nature is something that is... Um, you know, impacts us in a way that we're not often uh, enough aware of, of what's going on in nature and that we should be more aware of it and we should be more respectful of it and more cognizant of it because, it, because it's, it's in control. You've been creating art for a long time and now you're introducing yourself to a new genre of collectors. A lot of these collectors don't look like the traditional art world. Does that excite you, scare you? Like, where are you with that? It's very exciting. Very exciting. Very exciting. Sure. Exciting for the inevitable or like the unknown? Like, what's exciting? Art is, yeah, making art is fundamentally an act of communication. I mean, you're really making something because you want someone to look at it and you want someone to see it. The world's a big place. The art world is certainly bigger than it was when I was young, but it's still a, a very small subset of the culture. The culture is so much bigger. Um, I always thought it would be great to be able to address people, viewers, in a way which wasn't preconditioned by the art context. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
I mean, why be restricted to the art context, what's in the art magazines or what's in the museums? Um, anybody can, can interact. I mean, we all live in the visual world. We all live in a world of signs and symbols and their interaction. And in fact, the world of design is, is more or less runs now on the idea of juxtaposition. Right? We're all stylists now, right? <laughs> so in a way, what I'm doing in the NFT is to allow everyone to participate on a level of style right. and style, style slash meaning. It's different because the piece speaks to me, not because of one still image like your traditional paintings, but because of the movement and the fluidity in that. So I see what you mean by the style. Yeah, yeah, st yeah styling is... Um, you know, we all, we're all aware of it, some of us, you know, more than others. It's sort of how you know how to get dressed in the morning, how you know what goes with what, right? right. Uh, and it, I mean, it, it doesn't need to, but if, if you're into it and you find it fun, it's, um, you know, it's part of how we express who we are. Mm -hmm. So in your work, you've talked a lot about intent and how, you know, the artist, their intent isn't as meaningful as the outcome of the actual work. And this, uh, this process in the, the NFT, like at this moment in the NFT process, you have a lot of collaborators. The intent is one that you have to kind of share amongst the group of practitioners. What's that like? I mean, does that just knowing that some of your work that you... Uh, have just been so intentional about getting the outcome right. Well, what is that that process like? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, the, it's a little bit hard to talk about. There's a kind of, in the art world, the art context, which is probably very different from outside of the art context, there was an idea about the artist's intention. It was called intentionality, in, in which kind of, um, you know, the value of the artwork or, and, and the interpretation of the artwork was derived from this thing called the, the, the intentionality. All of my thinking, all of my writing, all of my development as an artist actually runs counter to that. Because I, I think that's in a way like saying, that's putting the cart before the horse. Mm -hmm. I say, Let, let's make something. After we've made something and after we've looked at it, then we'll deduce from what we can see what the artist's intention was. And that might, that artist might be, you know, yourself. So, but what you're asking about is, I have a clear vision of how I want this thing to look. Right. And I am trying to produce that effect with a team. And the team is trying to imagine what I see in my head. Yeah. So that's what, that's what you're calling the intent. And you're right, it's not easy. It's, uh, it requires um, all kinds of people skills and uh, kind of ability to speak a technological language, which I might not really be very good at speaking, to come up with the desired effect. It's, I have a little bit of practice in doing this because I've worked in the theater, I've worked in film, um, and you, you, whenever, you have to, whenever you need someone else to execute your vision, it's, um, it, it requires patience and, and trust and forbearance. But I like it. I like the process. Many things happen. One of which is you find out things you wouldn't have imagined before, on your own. Because you, you think we're going in this direction. Someone hears, oh, turn left. And they do this thing, which they think is a left turn. When you look at it, it's like, well, it's not really the left turn I had in mind, but I like your left turn better than my left turn. So we're, we're going to go with your left turn. So that kind of thing happens. The, especially working with composers. I'm not, I don't read music. I'm not a composer. I don't play an instrument. But I love music. So be able to say that to a composer, I hear something like X and have that person be able to create something in response to that and then the back and forth of that is, is, a, you know, is tremendously exciting. I would never have been able to do that any other way. When you're creating, like in the traditional sense, just like looking at, you know, the canvas and the paint, 
you you have this collage and it's like coming together line by line, piece by piece. But what's fascinating about that is you have to kind of visualize where you're going next or you have to experiment. Like here you get a chance to say, do this, take that away, uh, remove this, remix it, uh, go back to final state. And that's not something that you get to do with like, you know, canvas or paint. So does this paradox of choice just overwhelm you at any point? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I think that's cute. I think you just gave, gave me a great title. The, uh, what'd you call it, the overwhelming of choice? The paradox of choice. The paradox of choice is a great title for something. The, what we try to do in, whether it's a painting or an animation or NFT, we try to make these juxtapositions, these collaged bits of stuff, we try to make them feel necessitated, right? Yeah. Like it's not just stuff, but it's actually very directed stuff. You can't necessarily put your finger on what it means, but you know, it, you know it's not random. And that's the experience I think is really interesting. Then the viewer can project themselves into it and you know, to whatever degree they wish. But as long as it's not random, as long as it's, it's directed in a way, then you know, you get, you know you're gonna arrive someplace interesting psychologically. And I know the idea is yours and you'll never really tell us what you intend in any of your paintings, but for this NFT, what idea should a viewer walk away with beyond the tree of life? Because I think that's the obvious one. That's a great question, Q. I think what I would like people to come away with is the, the malleability of, of, of meaning and how the degree to which we all participate in that, that we're participating in seeing meaning be made in the moment as these figures literally come to life. They, they start out as outlines and then they get fleshed in and then they move and then they have gestures and they acknowledge each other. And in that moment, they are us and we are them. And it's that kind of, I want to say, imaginative, empathic projection into the image. It's just a line, it's just a line drawing. Yeah. But it, it, it elicits in us something like empathy. And I think it is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a place to be, a mental place to be, even a spiritual place to be. It's, um, it's optimistic. That makes sense. That makes sense. So as a traditional artist, one that has received so many accolades, you've done many things that aspiring artists would just dream of. Do you see this NFT as more so an extension of your career or reinvention? We don't know yet. I mean, for extension for sure. I mean, reinvent, uh, reinvention would, would imply that this is all I'm going to be doing for a long time. We don't know yet. Could be. I mean, for sure, extension. I mean, I think that if you're an artist, you're kind of making art all the time. You know, if someone said, I have, a, I have a very good friend who's a choreographer who I worked with many, many times over, the, over a period of 30 years. Uh, and she's a brilliant choreographer. I mean, really just, I think, a genius in all kinds of ways. There are times when she's been given a whole ballet company. I mean, she made a, we made a piece for American Ballet Theater. I think she had 40 dancers at her disposal. She made a piece of 40 dancers. Lately, in the pandemic, she's had two dancers. And she made a piece with two dancers. And then she made a piece just for one dancer. She made a piece for a robot, because someone said, here's a robot, make, do something with a robot. So I think if you're an artist, you, can make, you make art out of what is at hand. Right. And you make art all the time. So you've made art for many different purposes, but in this case, this is your first time making art for screens. Well, I've made films, but this is the first time I've made art for a screen that's, a, that's let's say, the screen of a laptop or the screen of a, of, a, of, a, of a device. Do you think that we can enjoy art on screens? It's a very good question. What is, I, for sure, I mean, since we all spend so many hours a day looking at screens, we better make art for screens because screens are a part of our lives. To not have art for screens is really a missed opportunity. 
the question of what is the difference between art in a painting and art on a screen remains to be seen. I think there's a difference. I'm not saying they're equivalent. I'm not saying they're the same. Like a tactile difference? Or? Yeah, of course tactile difference. There's something different about screens are, I think, because of how they're made and how the, what the materials are in, in, that, they, that they're used to be made of, are um, uh, you engage with them. I mean, certainly engage with, a, with when you're watching a film or something. You engage with them, but you're always on the surface in a way. And a painting, the same thing is true. You're also always on the surface. Maybe because it's 500 years of culture, culture or history, looking at paintings, Paintings absorb your gaze in a way which I think is different from the way screens do. Because in your work, like you almost train the eyes where to go when your work is complete. For me personally, when I look at a David Sally piece, I always start at one place and end up somewhere else. And anytime I look at the work, the same pattern is true. On a screen, do you feel like that train of thought is compromised? Yeah, no, that's, that's a big difference. And thank you for, that's a great compliment. I think that you get the Ideal Viewer Award, Q, because <laughs> having, having your eye move around is one of, my, one of my goals. Partly because of the size of a screen, even unless you're looking at a, you know, at a movie screen, a, a movie theater screen, your eye simply doesn't move in the same way. Your, your eye is more fixed on one focal length, one, one focal point. And that's quite different. I, I mean, I feel like we can use that, and we're, we are using that. But it's a little different experience. And so for one of my final questions, David, I have to ask you, when did you first hear of crypto? And then when did you think that this is something that you should take seriously? Mm. I can't remember when I heard, first heard about it. Quite a while ago, you know, years ago, I mean, people have been talking about digital art in the art world for many years. It reminds me of, of, the, of the, the revolution in the art world in the 70s with the, uh, the introduction of, of inexpensive black and white video cameras. Mm -hmm. And there was a certain point when you, to make a videotape, you'd have to go to a TV studio. And then at some time in the early 70s, uh, video equipment became portable and affordable. And all of a sudden, all the artists were out there making videotapes. Not necessarily very good ones, but it was an interesting moment. Um, so the idea of making something that's purely digital, that exists on a digital space and is a result of digital technology entirely, it's been around now for a very long time. And everyone has always, at least I've certainly always thought, it was only a matter of time until something really interesting came out of it. We hadn't seen it yet, but it was inevitable. I think that's where we are now. Now we're at that point where it's so much part of the culture is so much second nature to a certain generation that, of course, it's interesting. Um, it's artists have always, going back to the to the 1400s, artists have always availed themselves of any new technology that came along. I mean, that, you know, so we're 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 not different in that in that sense. And I like the tape analogy because when I think about it, it is a collaborative process, right? Like you have to see what's on screen and what's in front of you, and you have to hit record and pause, and then you have to remember where you last left off and continue the story or narrative, or you're just gonna let the tape run and get a new tape, right? It's almost like you're collaborating with the tech in a way. You're telling it what to do, what to capture, and if you program it incorrectly, it's gonna be a visual disruption. It's not much different than the crypto community where they see something happen and then there's a lot of people that go and remix the work or make something outside of it. Are you excited by that possibility or does people taking the David Sally tree of life and turning it into memes and other art scare you? Oh, I think it's great. I, th I think memes are probably the closest thing t to my art already that I can think of. I mean, they're much closer to what I already do than, than most other things in the art world. I think the, the idea of taking an image, extracting an image that's exactly the right image and having exactly the right kind of verbal linguistic counterpart to it, I mean, what's better than that? That's, I mean, that's life, that's, that's what we, we're doing that all day long anyway. I and mean, so to now have everyone all over the world be, have the ability to do that, is very exciting and I, because of the work I do, the way that I work, I mean, I've been talking about how I lifted these images from some guy in the, working in the 1930s. 
how could I object to someone doing the same thing to me? It would be, it would be uh, hypocritical. I mean, I think that it's, what we're really saying here is there's a continuity. I'm part of it. Someone else is also part of it. It's like we want to be in that river, but we can't say where the river is going to go or where it's, it's, not, it's, it's not going to stop. It's going to keep moving. You mentioned that a big part of your painting is having the viewer's eyes move around. Can you talk a bit about how when you bring the animation into your work, what does that afford you? Do you lose something? Because now you can almost kind of dictate where people's eyes go. So in the NFT, in the animated film, um, you'll see that things happen very quickly. It's, it's, there's a burst of movement across the screen, left to right, right to left, top to bottom. And these kinds of movements and the, the, the tempo at which these things happen and the ability to, to control that tempo and, to, and do direct the eye in a certain way, there's some things that, that diminish in spacing until they disappear in the vanishing point. The way that works in the NFT is very similar, or at least is analogous to what I'm trying to do in the, in the paintings. But in animation, it's, it's even more dynamic because we can, we can really control how, how your eye will move through the space in a, in a way which is, um, you know, is really fun. And the music also helps with that as well, because sound effects, as we all know, direct your eye in a certain way.